Kia ora team, welcome to our last block of content uh, for anatomy and physiology. So uh, for our first block of content we're going to look at the nervous system and a little bit on, on the brain structure and a little bit of function on the brain. Um, to start with we're going to list general functions of the nervous system, explain structural and functional classifications and then define the central and peripheral nervous system. Um, so we've got the nervous system which is the primary control system of the body. It even overrides um, your other communication system, which is your endocrine system. Um, it provides us higher mental function, emotional expression, big part of maintaining homeostasis and regulating activities, um, muscle contractions, productions of hormones from glands, those kinds of things. Um, the nervous system does this by communication through the nervous system, which is a comb combination of um, electrical and chemical signals. <clears throat> All the systems are under this control or regulation. If the nervous system so stops functioning, then the body can stay alive only with the assistance of life-supporting machines. So if the nervous system isn't function functioning as it should, it means that the coordination of everything within the body uh, won't be working, even if those structures have the capacity to function. <clears throat> very simple model of the structures of the nervous system. Um, so we have the brain and spinal cord, spinal cord and then we have all of the nerves which um, relay messages back and forth towards the brain and spinal cord. So compared to other structures, um, the main, um, uh, compared to other systems, the main structures are, are quite simple. This model is something to uh, be very familiar with. It's the function of the nervous system. So we have our sensory receptors, which, you know, an example would be your eyes um, receiving light <clears throat> and then sending that information to the central nervous system. The in integration spaces where that information is processed um, and then we have the motor output. So that's the effectors. So that's um, what happens based on the sensory input, the integration or decision making component, and then okay, what's the response to this? And the response is, isn't always doing something, it might be to not respond, but there is always some kind of output. Very similar to our homeostatic um, negative feedback loop, where we have our um, afferent or sensory information, there is an integration space, and then our efferent or motor output space. <coughs> We're going to look at a couple of ways of structuring, uh, classif classifying the nervous system. So, <clears throat> first two parts to sort of to understand is we have our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and your peripheral nervous system is all of the the wiring. I, I think of the, um, the peripheral nervous system as the wiring that um, comes out of our brain and our spinal cord and adds as the um, the messenger, that's where our messages have been sent. Uh, the central nervous system integrates and commands uh, what the nervous system needs to do, interprets incoming sensory information and issues instructions, whereas our peripheral nervous system consists mainly of nerves that extend out from the brain and the, sp and the spine. They carry impulses to and from the spinal cord, um, and they also carry impulses to and from the brain. Communication links, um, and they pretty much link the central nervous system with the rest of the body. If we look at uh, functional classification, so in terms of what actually happens, we have our sensory or afferent division. So afferent literally means um, to go towards, so messages are going towards the central nervous system. Um, these consist of nerves that carry impulses to the central nervous system from sensory receptors. So the word sensory is, is a good way to remember the sensory division. And it keeps our central nervous system constantly informed about events that are going on both inside and outside of our body. What's nice about the sensory side of the nervous system is it's um, quite simple. We've got our sensory organs and our sensory afferent pathways. And then on the other side, we have our motor division or the efferent division. These carry impulses from 
the central nervous system to effector organs. So these are things like our muscles, um, our glands, and they are to effect a motor response. A motor response means to do something. <clears throat> this is then split into two separate subcategories, the somatic nervous system. Um, this is our voluntary system. So it allows us to consciously or voluntarily control our skeletal muscles. Just note that most of the time we are consciously controlling our skeletal muscles, but not always there is um, as such things as a stretch reflex, which we'll talk about, um, where there is an um, involuntary response. And it uses the same pathways for this to happen. Uh, and the second part is the autonomic nervous system or involuntary, regulates events that are automatic, involuntary, things like smooth muscle contraction. So those are the muscle tissues that line things like um, our digestive and blood vessels, digestive organs and blood vessels, um, cardiac muscle uh, and our glands. The subdivision itself has two separate parts, our sympathetic and parasympathetic, which we'll talk about towards the end. But these two typically bring about opposite effects from each other. And you may have heard this before. So what one stimulates, um, the other inhibits. So now we're going to look at some of the structures of um, these nervous system divisions. <clears throat> the first one is looking at um, the cells that make up our nervous tissue. Now we have supporting cells. They're lumped together and are called neuroglia or um, glial cells or glia. And that name means nerve glue. So originally it was thought that the only sort of function of these cells was to hold neurons, our communicating cells, together. Um, but they have a bigger, much bigger function and there is a lot of different types of glial cells. <coughs> uh, this diagram here just shows you uh, the different types of glial cells. Um, that have slightly different functions. Um, some are there to support neurons, some are there to insulate neurons. We have some that protect neurons. So we've even got um, types of immune glial cells which fight against pathogens that are um, attacking the nervous system. You won't need to remember all of these different names and functions of individual glial cells. Just know that a glial cell is a supporting cell of our um, neurons. And that they have these different functions, supporting, insulation, and protection. And then the chief um, cell of nervous tissue is our neuron. They're also called nerve cells. Super highly specialized to transmit uh, messages. Uh, these are called nerve impulses from one part of the body to the other. Um, think of these as like your body's wiring. So these neurons stack end to end and can communicate with each other and then can communicate with your central nervous system um, the neurons of your central nervous system uh, and target organs they don't actually physically touch each other they have uh, like a small gap where um, chemical messages are sent from one to the other although they differ structurally from one another they do have common features so all have a cell body so you'll need to be able to uh, label a cell body um, which contains a nucleus uh, and one or more slendering processes which extends out from that cell body and that's called the axon. So you'll need to be able to label that. The cell body, identify the nucleus, you'll see mitochondria which is quite, um, which we understand is the energy production unit of a cell. Um, neurons use a lot of energy constantly so they have a lot of um, mitochondria. Then we also have our axon which is sort of like the communication space and then axon terminal is where that ends <clears throat> and then the little spiky things coming out of the cell body is um, are called dendrites and they are the almost like the listening ears of the neuron they receive information from either another neuron um, neurons in the brain or maybe from a sensory organ depending on the direction of the nervous tissue that we're talking about so just to recap cell body cells life support center contains a nucleus the dendrites receive signals from other cells and carry the impulse um, toward um, towards the cell body. So they'll bring the message into the cell body and then the axon passes messages away from the cell um, body to another neuron, to your muscles or to your target. And
Okay, let's look at some physiology. Um, nerve impulses are, are, are the electrical message that are sent along your neurons. Uh, and neurons have two major functions. They, uh, they have irrit irritabil irritability, so they have the ability to respond to a stimulus um, and convey it into a nerve impulse. So they detect um, some kind of stimulus and react to it. If you think about somebody that is irritable, if you annoy them, you don't have, actually have to do a lot to annoy them to create some kind of um, output. So a neuron is very irritable. And then they have conductivity. So that's the ability to transmit the impulse um, to other neurons, to muscles, and to glands. So those two functions um, sort of make up what a neuron is possible. What is possible from a neuron. And you'll see this red arrow shows the direction of that nerve impulse moving from one axon or one neuron to the next neuron. Okay, so we're going to talk about impulses now and something that's called um, an action potential. So this is the process of an electrical current moving along this neuron. Um, this is probably going to be the most complex process that we've talked about. So we will chat about it today, revisit in the tutorial, and we'll, we'll touch on it each week until the exam because it is quite a complicated process and it is going to be the long answer question. So <clears throat> every neuron um, has an arresting electrical condition. So the outside of the membrane, so outside of the axon, uh, outside of the neuron, that space is slightly positive. So you'll see in the diagram, you've got these pluses. So that space outside of the neuron is slightly positive. It has these um, Na pluses, which is um, a sodium ion, um, an atom, if you remember back at uh, like high school science, an atom has protons, neutrons, and electrons, and these things all have different charges. But as a whole, an atom has a, neg a neutral charge, so it's it's not positive or negative. It's the same, the same kind of charge of, of zero. Now, if you remove um, electrons which have a negative charge, um, that means that that atom now has an a positive charge so it's no longer neutral anymore it's positive so when you see Na plus what that is telling you is that it's an atom that has a positive charge and the only way for it to get that positive charge is to not have negative electrons uh, if <clears throat> it's been a while since you've looked at chemistry just know that if you see this symbol um, like Na or K then it's the um, it's it's the symbol for that atom. So we've got sodium here and K is potassium. And then the, the plus, it'll either be a plus or a minus. Usually it's a plus. Shows you that this, um, this molecule has a positive or a negative charge. So in this example, we've got a positive charge outside the um, neuron compared to inside, which is uh, slightly negative. And that creates this thing called polarity where there's a difference from one side to the other. As we know in, in nature having gradients um, the body doesn't like that or nature doesn't like that and it's always trying to match these gradients so because we have the cell membrane which at the moment won't let sodium or potassium just flood in or out we've got this um, gradient difference and it's a um, charge difference so it's called polarity and a resting neuron sits the difference between the two is, is negative 70 uh, millivolts. So in terms of measuring el electrical current, with electrical currency, we've got um, minus 70 millivolts. <clears throat> okay, so just to quickly recap, outside of the cell, we have a slightly positive charge. Inside the cell, cell we have a slightly negative charge. The polarity sits at minus 70 millivolts. Okay, the second step of a nerve impulse is that some kind of stimulus happens. So it might be you touching something that has um, that has a temperature that is hot. That stimulus, <coughs> detected by your sensory neurons, um, changes the permeability of an area of that neuron. So at the start of that neuron, the permeability of that cell membrane changes. And what happens is... Um, Sodium 
protein gates. So remember way back at the start of the top um, this course, we talked about protein channels and um, protein gates. Well, these gates, these sodium, uh, sodium gates open up and this allows sodium to start to flood inside to, of the neuron in this space. And this changes the polarity. So the inside of the cell starts to increase in um, positive charge. So we now have this uh, depolarization where the inside of the cell starts to increase in its positive charge and this decreases the charge on the outside. <clears throat> if the stimulus is big enough, what will happen is um, this depolarization will hit a threshold and it's like, um, so we, we said it, minus 70 millivolts. If the positive charge increases enough, the inside of this polarity becomes less uh, negative and it hits I think the threshold is around negative 55 millivolts once it hits that threshold then more gates open up and sodium floods in quite heavily and this creates this big spike in the charge and it actually becomes um, a positive polarity so you've now completely reversed the charge from the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell and this creates an action potential now this is happening just in one portion of the neuron. Um, once this action potential and that charge starts to go up, um, what's happening next to this portion of the neuron, um, this is actually triggers the same thing. So next door to this uh, action potential, the sodium gates next door to this space in the neuron start to open up and sodium starts to flood in to the cell in front of this action potential. And what that causes is this action potential to move along the neuron uh, and it will end up moving right across the whole neuron that's your um, propagation of the action potential or the movement of that electrical current and what's happening behind the action potential is um, potassium gates from the inside of the neuron are opening and they start to flood out to try and um, reset the polarity of this neuron <clears throat> Once the action potential moves past, we have this repolarization. So we're trying to get our positive charge on the outside compared to the inside, restoring the negative charge on the inside, um, and repolarization occurs. And it happens in the same direction uh, as the depolarization. So <clears throat> we have this shift of positive um, potassium ions moving from the inside to the outside and that starts to balance out um, the charge from the outside and the inside and once that action potential has moved along you've had this shuffle of sodium moving in and potassium moving out to uh, repolarize the neuron but what we need is to have that sodium back out and the potassium back in and that's where our sodium and potassium pumps come in they require energy um, and they are constantly shuffling uh, two potassium ions back into the cell and three uh, sodium ions back out of the cell. So you'll notice that you're getting this um, greater number of, greater number of uh, sodium ions being pumped out and potassium ions pumped in, and that resets our resting neuron at negative 70 uh, millivolts. And while this is happening, uh, another action potential can't happen until this is finished okay so that's uh, my best attempt of keeping that simple it will take a lot of um, watching videos explaining this to each other reading the chapter of the nervous system to fully understand this um, I always find this the hardest to explain um, so you do know that this you'll have to spend a bit of time on this but here's a diagram or a graph showing the electrical current of an action potential. <clears throat> Don't worry so much about the bottom graph. That's showing how permeable the cell membrane becomes. And this is to do with those gates opening and closing. So you've got sodium gates and potassium gates. Selectively permeable. So only when sodium gates open, only sodium can get in. When potassium gates, gates open, only potassium can get out. Um, and they move in and out depending on the gradient. So you've got more sodium on the outside. Or potassium on the inside so if the gates open they go in opposite directions so if we just follow this red line 
the red line is showing the electrical current that we have and that's the difference in um, currency between the outside and the inside of the neuron so we're sitting at negative 70 millivolts and that's because the inside is more negative than the outside a stimulus causes the polarity to change so the inside starts to increase in charge <clears throat> because sodium is coming in remember the stimulus creates this, the sodium channels to open and if it hits the threshold of negative 55 um, that triggers more sodium gates to open and that shoots the polarity um, into up to positive 30 and I think it can even be a higher positive 40 if the stimulus doesn't trigger enough sodium into the cell then it won't hit the threshold and the action potential won't be created so you know when you've got like a small insect crawling around on your hand and you might not feel it the stimulus isn't big enough to trigger an action potential so that's why you don't notice it's there all right so we've got this big spike we hit the threshold an action potential is created um, and it's always the same the the level of um, increase in charge doesn't change it's always going to um, go up to plus 30 millivolts um, how a stimulus is greater for us is how many of these action potentials are created so if you're lifting a can of baked beans there will be a stimulus that is created compared to if you try and lift a car then the amount of action potentials needed to lift a car will increase once the action potential um, hits plus 30 millivolts then behind it the potassium gates are opening to allow this um, to reverse the polarization and then that charge starts to drop and then it actually overcompensates goes a little bit lower than negative 70 and then your sodium and potassium pumps restore and it comes back to its um, it's resting minus 70 <clears throat> remembering too that this action potential in this space in the neuron triggers triggers uh, creates a stimulus for um, this depolarization to happen in front of it so it, it's moving down the neuron so sodium is filling up is heading into the neuron in front of it and then behind it potassium is coming out and then your sodium potassium pumps are restoring that um, resting charge here is another diagram that's showing the different gates so your green gates are your sodium pumps are your sodium gates sorry um, and uh, yellow is your potassium have a look at this in your own time uh, I feel like maybe if I explain it again I'm at risk of making it more confusing I understand that it will be confusing right now so maybe check out some of the videos I have on Moodle um, read the chapter of the nervous system have another look at this and um, we will touch on this each week okay so now we've looked at um, some of the structures of the nervous system and how uh, electrical messages are sent there's a couple of other things to talk about so we've got reflexes which are rapid um, they're predictable and involuntary responses to stimuli so if you think about any time you've um, had a reflex it's something that happens really quick and you don't often think about it uh, or you won't think about it so think of a reflex as a pre-programmed response to a given stimulus and it's there so that you can um, protect yourself so number one here we have uh, something happened to the skin so there's there's that nail that's in gone into the skin a bit like um, triggering the inflammatory response which we looked at last week uh, number two is that message is sent down our sensory <coughs> a sensory neuron and then in our spinal cord is where we have the integration space um, so remember our brain and our spinal cord is our central nervous system so that's where the integration space is, is. it's not as specialized as the brain so it has a pre-programmed message to then send down the motor neuron and to our muscles to take a hand off that nail or to move it quickly and that's a safety thing you don't need the brain to go oh that's a nail i need to take my hand off it um, all you need to know is it's hurting i need to move it so the reflex is to try and limit any kind of damage later on your brain will work out what's going on and am I actually at risk uh, and here's a diagram each corner is just showing a different example um, so on the left here we've got a knee-jerk reaction so you might have done it before you can even have a go now just sitting on your desk on your chair 
make sure your feet are dangling and if you have um, somebody whack just underneath your patella on the tendon you have these stretch receptors in there if it detects um, quick stretching there will be a, a reflex to contract your quads to extend your leg to try and limit that stretch not to damage a tendon so we've got these stretch reflexes in our body in our muscles to stop it in our tendons to stop us from lifting more than we can handle um, or if we're moving through a big velocity and that stretch is really big the muscles the antagonist muscles contract to try and save that um, that action and then on the right we've just got that same um, pain sensory so there's a pain from the, the um, tack and then the body takes its hand off it by contracting your biceps <clears throat> so we've just got sensory input um, then we've got the integration at the spinal cord and then we've got the motor output We've got some somatic reflexes, so we can split reflexes into two. So activation of skeletal muscles is our somatic, um, and then autonomic reflexes, things like smooth muscle regulation, heart and blood pressure regulation, regulation of glands, and digestive system regulation. Okay, and then the last component of our nervous system is to look at our um, the final part of the auto, uh, autonomic nervous system. So we have our sympathetic function, which is our fight, flight, or freeze, um, or our fight and flight response, which you may have heard of. This think of this as the E division: exercise, excitement, emergency, embarrassment. So anytime you've been uh, exercising, you feel excited. There's an emergency, or you've been embarrassed. Your heart rate will increase. Um, force of contraction of your heart rate will increase. Uh, dilation of your lungs, so you're breathing heavier, or you're getting more um, oxygen in decreased digestive activity so breaking down and digesting food isn't going to be important right this second um, constrictions of blood vessels and viscera and skin so <clears throat> dilation of vessels will happen in things like your skeletal muscle so that you're ready for action um, and then you've got dilation of blood vessels and skeletal muscle in your heart so areas that need blood and oxygen because potentially you're going to have to either fight run away um, or freeze, which is a response to being in a situation where you might be unsure of how to respond. And then the flip side, the opposite, is our parasympathetic function. Think rest, digest. It's our D division, digestion, defecation, diuresis. Di defecation, diuresis is number ones and number twos. So the idea here is to conserve energy. So it's when we're relaxed and safe, uh, maintaining our daily necessary bodily functions. So getting rid of waste, digesting food, um, decreases heart rate, constriction of e airways in the lungs, so we're trying to, we don't need as much air in anymore, so those airways can constrict a bit. Digestion increases, and but there's little or no effect on our blood vessels. Um, because you're getting enough blood flow as you need right now. So this is, um, you'll see these pictures here show things like uh, recovery, uh, relaxation, breathing, uh, so it's all things to do with recovery. So if you think of sympathetic and parasympathetic, and if you reflect on like exercise and lifestyle, generally um, like exercise is a stress, and then we rest to recover. If you continually exercise and not rest, you will break down eventually. Life stresses are very similar. Um, stressful situations are okay if you know how to manage them and recover from them, but constantly being in that stress environment without having the parasympathetic space uh, is detrimental long term so being able to do things like um, practice breathing um, being in the moment um, relaxation sleep uh, allowing your body to digest food correctly is really really important for recovery uh, here's a bit of a summary of the parasympathetic and sympathetic um, functions of each side so you'll need to be able to um, you know, fill out a table and that lets me know what's happening to some of these common organs, either from a parasympathetic response or sympathetic response. Uh, and here's a table that just summarizes all of those. So you can have a look at that in your own time. Okay, we're going to go through structure and function of the brain. Um, different portions. So we've got a frontal at the front, temporal at the side, parietal at the top of the back, occipital at the very back. Those are your um, four lobes, and then you have your cere cerebellum at the bottom, at the back, and then your brain stem, which sort of um, links your brain with your, your spine. And each of these have different functions, um, or control different outputs. 
<clears throat> things like vision, um, processing information about temperature and taste. Uh, in the quiz this week, you'll have to be able to identify these regions and be able to go, okay, that region does this, this, this. So you'll be able to recognize the physiology of each region of the brain. <clears throat> Something that we often know but don't understand why is why does the left side of the brain control the right side of the brain decustation a decusation there's a space just before the brain stem where the nerves that run up your spine cross over so they run up your spine left and right and then they cross over and feed the different hemispheres of the brain um, and this is why the left side generally will control the right side Um, our brain is pretty important based on you know what like the structures that we just looked at and the physiology of those so we have um, meninges which are structural components of the um, layers of the brain and we have cerebrospinal fluid <clears throat> and then we have harm, uh, protection of harmful substances shielded by the blood brain barrier so we have this um, integration of the blood brain barrier which helps stop um, substances get in so we'll just touch on these individually. Meninges, three connective tissue membranes protecting the brain. So these are the outside membrane made up of connective tissue. Dura, achenoid, and pia. Um, superficial, middle, and deep. So just being able to identify those three layers um, is important. The functions of this connective tissue is to cover and protect the central nervous system, um, protect any of the blood vessels that are feeding the brain, and they also um, contain our cerebrospinal fluid, or sometimes you'll see it as CSF. Uh, and it f these structures form partitions within the skull, so they help create the different sections within the brain. Uh, here's a diagram just showing the different structures. So you've got your like your skull, your um, cerebrum, which is the brain, and then on your right here, you'll see the different layers of the. Uh, meninges. You might have, you might have heard of things like meningococcal disease. That's where these connective tissue components of the brain, or the spinal cord, because you have this structure in your spinal cord, have been uh, Im Im impacted. And you'll see how they, the meninges protect the blood vessels which run through the brain. So the cerebrospinal fluid helps reduce the weight of your brain by floating it. So your brain is about one and a half kilos the cerebrospinal fluid reduces the weight to about 50 grams which is um, great for protection it's like floating around in a slushy bath this helps protect the brain from impact so if you think about how quickly you can move through water compared to running so the fluid helps reduce the speed of brain during impact supplies nutrients and removes waste from our central nervous system so we have cerebrospinal fluid in our um, spine as well. It also helps to regulate um, the chemicals that are in the space and the pH of the central nervous system. Blood brain barrier, so you'll see up here we've got the, the brain is intertwined with vessels. It's a protective mechanism, mechanism that helps maintain a stable environment. We don't want big changes in homeostasis around the brain. So the blood brain barrier helps regulate that um, substances getting in and out it's a selective barrier that allows the good stuff nutrients to pass through but less permeable capillaries than in the body so they don't allow as much in and out.